The Epic Life Ministry presents replays of sermons by the late Pastor Bob Hallman. It is our intention to equip the saints to boldly share the gospel of Jesus Christ by showing them how to love God, love others, and make disciples. We pray through these message replays, you will be equipped to share the good news and make disciples of all nations as Jesus instructed us to do. Please enjoy the message. Hey, I wanna, I wanna talk about the great omission and I'd like to begin by reading the text, beginning in verse 16, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. So if you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. And again, just the background on this is that uh, Jesus died on the cross. He was buried for three days, rose from the dead, uh, had an encounter uh, with the women at the tomb. Uh, they were instructed to go back and tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee. And uh, that's where we find ourselves picking up in the text. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Father, we thank you for your word. And I thank you, God, that on this particular day, appointed before time began, that we would be here, this exact number of people and the exact composition of our fellowship right now. And God, this word would all be con converging on this very specific moment that we'll never live again, that we'll never have a chance to, to have a do-over on this. And I pray that everything that you have planned for our time today would come to pass, that nothing would be lost, that your word would go out and accomplish the purpose for which you're sending it. It would not fall to the ground, but it would achieve the purpose, God, that you have in mind. And so, Holy Spirit, we need you. I know I need you, but we all need you. I need you to be able to speak clearly. I need you to be, able to, uh, to be able to communicate your heart about this issue of the Great Commission. And Lord, we need you to, have, uh, to give us ears to hear and hearts to respond and eyes to see. So show us wonderful things out of your word today. And we pray that you be blessed by the response that you see from our hearts saying, yes, Lord, to whatever you call us to do and whatever you call us to be. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Well, I've entitled this, uh, this part one of this final section of Matthew 28, The Great Omission. And uh, the reason I want to start out with that is because it's kind of the elephant in the room of evangelical Christianity. We know that this is the calling of the church. We know that making disciples, that includes everything from pre-evangelism all the way through helping someone come to know Christ through the gospel presentation, through helping them learn basic things like how to have a quiet time. How to, how to know uh, what the Bible uh, teaches and how to even know what, you know, like we're in Matthew 28. Uh, and if some people don't even know what Matthew 28 is. They don't know, what does that mean? Is that a person? Is that a place? And 28, what does that mean? And what's the colon mean? And what do the verses after that mean? There's so many people that it's that basic for them that they really need that kind of simple instruction. They need to know how to pray. They need to, they need to have a model on how to avoid sin and how to overcome temptation. Almost every person I've ever led to Christ has stuff going on in their life that's unresolved, and it's not under the lordship of Christ yet, and they want to know how to do that, and, and how to do that in a way that honors the Lord, and it still doesn't, you know, turn their life upside down or right side up, and sometimes that's exactly what should happen. So there's a, there's a great need in the world for people to uh, be discipled and have someone mentor them. I like to call discipleship friendship with a purpose, because that's really what it boils down to. What Jesus is calling the disciples to do is to befriend the world. In fact, I would call it more than befriend them. He says, love the world. He says the two great commands, what are they? To love God with everything that we've got and then to love one another. And then in our church, our, our, our objectives, kind of our statement of faith for our church is loving God, loving others, and making disciples. Why making disciples? Because it's the great commission. We have the greatest command and we have the greatest commission to make disciples. When we make disciples, we're actually obeying God. When we obey God, we're loving him. So if you want to really love God, be a part of the Great Commission. If you really want to love other people, there's nothing that you can do for them that's greater, of greater service to them than helping them draw close to God. 
And it's simple as being willing to be friends with people. That's really what it comes down to. I mean, yeah, there's some tools. Yes, there's some methodology at times. But people have their own personalities. Some of you guys have completely different personalities and backgrounds here. And, and there are tools that are available for you that we have as a church. And we do a lot of training and, and teaching of disciple making in this church. It's a real emphasis for our fellowship. However, having said that, there is no perfect right way to do this. But what's important is that we're all coming alongside another person and helping them make progress in their walk with God so that they have confidence and they're not just saved and expected to figure this out by themselves and bump along for 5 or 10 or 15 years uh, and, and not know how to do simple things that they should be learning in the first week of becoming a Christian. I won't ask for a raising of hands, but um, when Becky and I teach on discipleship, uh, I guess this is music over here, uh, when we teach on discipleship, uh, we'll often ask people if they've ever been discipled, meaning, did anyone teach you how to have a quiet time in the first week or two of your Christian life? Did anyone teach you how to pray? Did they come alongside with you and, and spend time just studying the word together with you? Did they enjoy having you over at the house for a barbecue and, and just enjoying company together? Uh, did you learn from them how to handle temptation and how to deal with the problems that you were facing? If you didn't, and I would probably say statistically, based on our experience over 35 years of being involved in disciple making, about 90% or 95% of the people have never been discipled. And many of them have been Christians for decades, for 50, 60 years in some cases, never discipled. And because of that, they don't have a model on knowing how to actually do that for others. The result is, is that our, our churches are filled with, even with pastors that have never been discipled. I was never discipled by somebody. I never had someone come, really come along and help me early in my Christian life. I just got saved, and then I knew I was supposed to read the Bible. I bumped along through that for a long time. No real methodology, no real understanding of, of how to do it. I just knew it was important, so I kind of kept at it and kept at it, didn't give up. And I learned along the way. I read articles, etc. Same with prayer, same with everything else. I just kind of pulled myself up by my bootstraps, and really it wasn't me. It was God and the Holy Spirit helping me. But I so wished and longed for someone to come alongside. I even asked for it. Uh, and I said, can somebody help me? I, I really don't know exactly what to do next. Well, just come to church and just kind of be a part of things, you know, come to a study. And all those things were helpful, but I still found myself a bit lost. And uh, I'm, I'm going to share halfway through this message a brief testimony about my own journey in disciple making and the decision that God finally brought me to is that I couldn't ignore this command any longer in my life. And that's why it's been called the elephant in the room of evangelical Christianity, because it's the greatest commandment. And yet, most of us have never been discipled by someone. And because of that, most of us have never discipled someone in turn either. So this, this next couple of messages are designed to, first of all, uh, excite a curiosity in you, recognize exactly what's at stake here, and then also give you some real basic tools on how to get started. But at the end of all of this, we're going we're gonna to actually give you a chance to get discipled, those of you that are interested. Uh, whether you're a new Christian or an older Christian, in some very basic ways. I don't know how many people, I had a bunch of people last night were saying, I, I, want, I need that. I, I want that. The stuff you were talking about last night uh, at the service, uh, that describes my Christian life right now. And it's, and it's not what I want it to be. And, and I've always struggled with that great commission, knowing it's there and knowing that I'm really not engaged. And so I want to encourage you. First of all, we're a church that is engaged in disciple making. We don't do it perfectly. I don't have it completely wired. But we're aiming at it and we're pushing for it. And we continue to advance that cause of engaging this mission of disciple making. And, uh, you know, I've been a part of church uh, for 35, going 36, 7 years, somewhere in there now. And many of those years serving in ministry and uh, on paid staff as either an associate pastor or a pastor or a uh, youth leader, and what I found is that the church has meetings and events and functions and conferences, but it's very common that they're not making disciples. Uh, we give our time and our resources to church, and we have all kinds of things that we're constantly busy doing, but there's no disciple-making going on. We have rallies and political action committees and people vying for certain political parties, and right now we're in the midst of that, and people are like really, really aggressive about that stuff, but we're not making disciples. We build big churches with big buildings and even bigger mortgages. And the, and the church itself becomes kind of the centerpiece of the entire ministry, but still no disciples. We have aerobics for body conscious. We've got groups for people over 50 and for teenagers. We've got groups for people that struggle with addiction. 
but there's not necessarily a disciple-making model in place. You know, I went to seminary uh, after about three years of ministry, realizing that I, I needed training. What I really needed was I needed a discipler. I needed a mentor. But because I couldn't really find one, I, I thought I need to go to a place to get that. And what I, you know what I discovered? I, I discovered they teach homiletics. They teach exegetical uh, Bible discovery. They talk about uh, I had to learn Hebrew and Greek. I had to learn apologetics. I had to learn counseling. I had to learn church history. You know what they didn't do? They didn't, they didn't evangelize, and they didn't teach evangelism. And the other thing they didn't, didn't do is they didn't teach how to carry out the Great Commission. It was like it just evaporated. It was like it's the, it's the one thing that Jesus said at the end of his life, uh, at, at the beginning of his life, after the end of his life, after the resurrection, he said, this is what I'm commissioning you to do. This is what you are to engage with for the rest of your life and for the rest of human history until I come again for the church that I have built that the gates of hell won't prevail against. And he gives the church this privilege. And he says, go for it. And be a part of the epic life. Be a part of the greatest thing a man or woman can ever do, which is come alongside and help another person find saving faith in Christ. And then to grow in that faith. And then to be reproductive themselves. There's a great author, uh, Dawson Trotman, who had a real influence on my life. He's the founder of Navigators. Some of you may be familiar with that group but it's a parachurch group that just does what the church sometimes doesn't do. And by the way, that's why parachurch groups exist. They exist because the church is not engaged necessarily in the Great Commission. And so the parachurch groups arise, para meaning alongside of the ecclesia, the groups alongside of the church, and they step in and fill that big gap that the church sometimes misses, which is the Great Commission. And so these parachurch groups concentrate on that. Well, Dawson Trotman was a part of that, of a launching of that group called Navigators, and he wrote a little pamphlet called Born to Reproduce. If you have a pen or paper, I want you to write that down, and I'd like to encourage you to download that uh, from internet. It's free. It's about 20 pages. It's really short. Even if you don't like reading, it's short. That's, that's really short, and it's mostly stories. Uh, it's got scripture in there, of course, but he's making a, 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 an appeal and an exhortation for this disciple-making life and, and it changed my life. It was huge, a huge component of what put a fire under me and said, I cannot, in good conscience, live the balance of my Christian life ignoring this great commission. Well, I want to talk to you about some of the, some of the consequences of the omission of not, participation, not participating in the great commission. And so it's going to take me just a few minutes to go over these things. And, and they are kind of sequential. In other words, they, they start and, and things kind of deteriorate the longer that we're not engaged in this mission. And some of you are going to find that maybe you have some of these challenges in your own life. And I'm not saying that, that, uh, that being a part of the Great Commission is a silver bullet for everything in your life. But what I can say is that when we're walking in the will of God, amazing things happen. And when we find ourselves satisfied with what God has called us to, amazing things happen. And when we find ourselves engaged in the things that God cares about and God loves and God cherishes and God is committed to, man, God gets on top of that. And, and he starts funneling resources and capacity and strength and opportunity for us to be engaged in the most important work on the planet, which is the Great Commission. But there's a price to be paid and, and I would say the church sometimes pays this price. I know I've paid the price for not being engaged in the Great Commission for the first three to four years of men. I was a pastor, and I wasn't engaged. Why wasn't I engaged? Because I was so busy doing church things. Isn't that a crazy thing? You can actually be so busy doing church that I'm not actually engaged in what Jesus said to do. Well, if you have your notes, you can follow along, but... One of the consequences of non-participation in this calling that God has given us, this great privilege, is spiritual boredom. We're always preparing but never engaged. As Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 7, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And so one of the consequences of, of being a person that always learns but never engages is you get bored. It's just honest. It's just, you just, why am I doing this? Why am, I mean, honestly, if I weren't a pastor and if I weren't engaged in, in the Great Commission, I wouldn't study the Bible nearly as hard as I do. There are a lot of things that I wouldn't do nearly as diligently as I do simply because I've been given the calling and the task to do it. But if I didn't have that, honestly, I, I, I worry about myself. I need this job, you know? 
uh, not for any other reason except for just the accountability. And, and that's what happens whenever you lead and you step forward and God calls you to serve. It's like the accountability goes up, the, 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 the joy goes up, the, the opportunity to bear fruit goes up, everything increases. And suddenly I'm, I'm being transformed by the power of God simply by taking responsibility and being a part of the work of God. Well, after boredom comes spiritual disciplines. They become a drag. I mean, it's like always preparing for the big game, but knowing you're never going to play. And because you choose not to play. How long are you going to go to practice? Week after week, day after day, and, and knock yourself out and exhaust yourself, knowing full well that you never intend to play. Well, nobody's going to do that very long. And so the spiritual disciplines are hard for us to keep up on, hard to have a quiet time, hard to pray. We're just, it's tough. Well, we don't need those things necessarily if we're not engaged in the mission, although we certainly need them anyway just for our walk with God. Well, we get spiritually dry after that. We're kind of like the church in Revelation chapter 3, Laodicea. We're not hot or cold. We're just kind of lukewarm in our walk with God. The result is we lack zeal. That, that zeal that comes with the, the joy of serving the Lord just kind of evaporates, and we find you know, ourselves kind of like, I'm just not that excited about God. I mean, we have trouble admitting it because we know it's like, yeah, we should be excited about God. But if we're really honest with ourselves, it's like, ah, this is like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it, you know, and I know it's the right thing and I'm, it's the good thing and it's a worthwhile thing and I know God honors it. But if we're really honest, sometimes our zeal and our joy in actually serving the Lord is not very strong, even though God has called us to experience that. That results in a lack of love for God where like the church in, in, uh, in Ephesus in chapter 2 of Revelation that Jesus speaks to. You know, they, they, um, they were doing all these wonderful things. In fact, by the time you get through this list of all this stuff this church is doing, you think God's going to commend them for all this. But no, he says instead, but I have one thing against you. You've left your first love. The most important things you've gotten derailed from and you've gotten focused on things that are important and of great value and significance that are a part of the function of the church and the outreach to the community and all the things that we're a part of as a church as well. But at the end of the day, Jesus says, I want you to love what I love. And you know what Jesus loves? He loves people. He loves people. That's why he sent his son. And his son came to seek and to save that which was lost. Why? Because God's heart loves people. And so now we're his representatives. We're ambassadors of Jesus Christ according to 2 Corinthians 5. And he calls us and he sends us out to be ambassadors of that message. But if we, if we fall away from that or drift away, and most of the time it's not a disobedience, it's just because we don't know how to do it. That's really the bottom line. Yeah, it's a little costly. It's like having kids, to be honest with you. But, you know, you think about those of you that are parents, would you ever, ever look back, and well, maybe some of you might, would you ever look back and think to yourself, I wish I never had them? Now, don't say yes, because you're going to mess up my illustration here. Uh, but most parents are like, yeah, it's hard. Yeah, there were some tough times, but wow, how rewarding. Boy, did I grow up, you know. Uh, what, what benefit we reap even as parents in this process of raising children. And making disciples in some, some sense is very similar to that. It's not easy work. It's not, it's not easy to do. But I would say most Christians... If they are not engaged, it's not because they're resistant or don't want spiritual kids. It's just that they've never been discipled and they really are just like a little bit lost. And I want to say you don't have to be lost. And, and we can actually teach you some very systematic and simple tools that will put you in a, in a place where for the rest of your life, you can pass on these tools. Most of the tools that we teach only take an hour to teach somebody. You just teach them in little segments. They're almost like block courses, you know, instead of making a commitment of, I'm going to be your disciple maker for the next three years. You know, you're going to come and live in my house and uh, we're going to go do ministry together. Well, maybe some of you are going to be called to that, but discipling can be as simple as spending, you know, just four weeks with someone, teaching them how to have a quiet time and helping them be successful in prayer. You know, that can be all it, all it is. And, and for most Christians that I meet, it's not that they don't want to, it's because they don't know how to. And we're going to correct that for those that are interested. Not everybody has to do this. But for those that have a heart for it, we're going to give you the tools to be able to, uh, to, to be a disciple maker. Well, when the, when the lack of love of God kicks in, the next thing that happens is you start neglecting fellowship because the, the engine, the spiritual engine is just dry. The, the oil is out of the tank 
and that leads to just not really wanting to be that involved, and that leads to a vulnerability to sin. A good example of that, of course, is King David in 2 Samuel chapter 11, where the text says it was springtime, and when kings usually, usually go off to war, and that was David, he should have gone off to war. Instead, he reclined at home, and he fell into sin with Bathsheba. And that's what happens when you get completely out of the game, is you really become vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. Well, spiritual boredom leads to spiritual immaturity. And it leads to an ignorance of God. In, uh, in Paul's writing to Philemon, chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, I pray that you'll be active in sharing your faith so that you'll have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. So one of the benefits of being active and engaged with younger Christians and helping them grow is that you constantly get reminded about the truths of the faith. I can't tell you how many times I've taught people how to have a quiet time or how to pray or taking them through the little blue book we've got. We call it the blue book, one-to-one -one disciple making. Uh, hundreds of times. And I never get tired of it because I'm reminded of these very basic truths of the faith and I get all fired up again simply by discipling and mentoring someone else and seeing their excitement in the Lord. While spiritual immaturity and ignorance leads to instability, I don't grow up in my faith. I'm not reaching the full measure of the fullness of Christ that Paul talks about in Ephesians 4. And the result is I'm, I'm like an infant, just tossed around, you know. I'm not, I'm not growing up. I should be reproducing. But I'm, I'm so spiritually young and unprepared and not thinking about helping anyone else that it, I've really made the Christian life predominantly about me. You know, God bless me. God help me. God favor me. God uh, fix this problem. God fix that problem. And, and I'm, I'm like a child. You know, it's, it's all about me. Feed me. Change me. Fix me. Make life happy for me. And, um, and the, the, the terrible thing when I was living in that place was that I wasn't satisfied with that. I felt no joy. I wasn't experiencing the, the privilege and the, the excitement about this Christian life. I was just kind of, in fact, times, to be honest with you, I, I got kind of addicted to the sense that God was kind of, it was his job to make me happy. And so I would come to him and I would pray. And if he didn't answer, I'd be like, God, why? Why won't you do this for me? Why won't you take care of this? Why would you let this happen? You see, the, so much of it became about me versus about God's agenda and God's purpose and God's goal, which is the Great Commission. And so it led to instability. And of course, that leads to what I call developmental delay. Hebrews chapter 5, uh, the writer says, in fact, by this time you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of the faith all over again. And that's where a lot of Christians are. Uh, and I can say even for myself in the first three or four years of ministry as a pastor, as somebody on a staff of a church, I just was like, teach me something else again I already know. You know, teach it to me again in a different way that's more interesting this time. You know, uh, surprise me with a new illustration I've never heard before to kind of excite my, my senses and educational desire to know more about the Bible. And it kind of became that, that pursuit versus how can I take the tools that I get from church and go to town and the community and, and the neighborhood I live in for the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, this leads to the third uh, major category, which is spiritual vulnerability. Because when, when there's a, a, a knowledge that God's design for us is to bear fruit, to live the abundant life, to live the, ep I call it the epic life. I don't know of a better word than that to describe what God has called us to. When, 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 we, when we don't experience that, and yet we know that that's the promise, and, and we know that God doesn't lie, and we know by faith that God is good, and he's good for all of his word, then we come to this position, this very difficult position of having to say, I know it's true, I'm just not experiencing it. And it's hard for us to admit, because we almost feel like we're betraying scripture, like we're, we're somehow disloyal to being uh, faithful to God by simply being honest about the fact that that when we're not engaged in this mission, a lot of the Christian life becomes somewhat tedious and somewhat difficult. And dare I say, on occasion, even boring. And that leads to a hunger for the experiential. We look for something outside of God's great commission to get us fired up. So we look for the, the, uh, the supernatural. Uh, we look for the misuse or we experience the misuse of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts have a very simple purpose. It's the advancement of the agenda of God. What's the agenda of God? The Great Commission. So these spiritual tools are used to advance the cause of Christ, very much like someone building a home. They've got a tool belt. they got all those tools. If somebody's a really good builder, they don't walk around and show you their tool belt. They show you the house. 
you know? They're not saying, hey, look at the new hammer I got. It's like top of the line, you know? It's like, well, I'm, it's beautiful. <laughs> Happy for you, I guess. You try to work up some excitement, but when you see the house, it's like, wow. And you did all of that with this? That's amazing, you know? And so the tools of the, of the gifts of the Spirit are tools, but we've glorified them and turned them into a validation of whether we're really close to God, whether God loves us, and, and we use them for self-gratification and self-adulation and self-attention rather than for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And I can't tell you how much bad doctrine comes out of that simple error of not using the gifts to advance the cause of Christ, which is the Great Commission. The result is the newest fad, the, the laughing movement, the health and wealth, the name it and claim it. I don't even want to tell you what it is. I know a lot of you don't even know what those things are, and I, I'm glad. Uh, but uh, but those, those false teachings exist because I think that there is a great desire on the heart of truly born-again men and women of God to be a part of an epic life, and they're not experiencing it. And someone comes along and promises, if you come to this meeting, if you come to this particular evangelist or this healer or this prophet, that something is going to happen. I'm not saying that can't happen. God has, he can do anything he wants, any way he wants. But I'm saying there's a pursuit of that so frequently in the hearts of really solid, godly men and women who have reached a place where they, they're, they're seeing a, a disjuncture between the promise of God and the lifestyle of the disciples and the calling of Christ from their existence, and there's a gap, and they don't know how to fill it, and so they're looking for something, and sometimes that leads to a vulnerability to, uh, to heresy, to false teaching, and even to cultic teaching. And then finally, it leads to spiritual apathy. When, when you exhaust all those avenues and you realize that those don't hold water either, it leads to a fading desire for the mission. And you don't think of yourself like Paul told Timothy, to think of himself as a soldier under the command of the, of the chief commander, which is Jesus Christ. And we begin to think like civilians. And what does a civilian want? What do we all want? We want to be happy. We want to, we want to be secure. We want to be problem-free. I mean, this is really the challenge that I think, well, I, I can only speak for me. Maybe I'll just speak for me. This is a challenge for me even as a, as a pastor and even as a Christian, there's a, there's a part of me, I want those things. I want life to be easy. I want life to be secure. I want promises and confidence about this existence. And God doesn't offer them to me. And so I still sometimes pray for those. There's a longing in me for that. And then I'm, then I'm countered by my quiet times morning by morning that God says, I don't want a civilian, Bob. I want a soldier. I want a man after the heart of God. He's looking for men and women after the heart of God that will fall on, under the command of Jesus Christ and in line with his great work, which is the Great Commission, which is winning men and women to Christ and helping them grow in their walk with God. Not perfectly. Does anybody ever get this right? Well, let me ask you a question. Does anybody ever parent their children right? Did any of you who raised your kids do it perfectly? And because you couldn't do it perfectly, did you just put them on the curb? Well, some of you might have, but, but most of us don't. We just kind of bumble along through the whole process. And at the end, we're like, wow, they turned out okay. You know, or they didn't turn out okay. But, you know, God's got time. He's still working in their life. So, so the, the, the spiritual experience of developing people spiritually is so parallel to simply raising children, but not as long, you know. Uh, because when you have physical kids, I used to think 18, they'd be gone and it would be over. And then as I got older, I realized that they just never, ever really go away. And, uh, and you don't really want them to. Uh, that there's a real joy in, in being involved in their life uh, under most circumstances. So, there, but there's this fading desire for the mission because we just kind of get exhausted feeling this terrible, you know, like, I know I should be, but I don't know how. And, and I don't, I can only feel guilty so long before I just get, I kind of collapse under the weight of it. So I'm just not going to think about that anymore because it's too painful because I don't know how to do it, and I feel awkward about it. I don't even know how to get started, and I'm just going to go back to, to just trying to be a good person and, um, and take care of myself. Well, then the spiritual objectives take a backseat to our own desires. Paul was talking about Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and he said Demas left because he loved the things of the world. You know, if we don't have this epic life, if we're not really walking in this life of multiplying ourselves and seeing God use us in this kind of a way, because there's, all I can tell you, it's not just the excitement of, of seeing it happen. It's a supernatural joy that the Holy Spirit pours into the life of somebody that's doing that work. It's, it's otherworldly. It's not, it doesn't even make sense. 
But, but when that flow isn't there, then uh, we can become like Demas, where we start falling in love with other things that are simply poor replacements for this great experience, this great adrenaline. I'm, a, I'm kind of a, an adrenaline junkie, I've got to be honest. I love adrenaline. I love doing hard things. I love pushing myself. I love pain. I'm not saying everybody's like that, but, um, uh, but that, that's kind of me. And, and I, I, want, I want my life to, I want things to move forward. I want to experience joy. I want to experience a rush, but I don't want to have it come through drugs, and I don't necessarily want to constantly be on the, on the march, because I did some of that when I was younger, of looking for the next great adventure that's going to, you know, jangle me and, and make me, you know, have a near-death experience again. And, uh, and I want to be able to just have it in the, in the norm, normalcy of my Christian life. And what I can tell you is that you know, if you, if you just even think about what it's like to go and witness to somebody and how nerve-wracking that is and how you pray and, you know, and you come out to our, all the outreaches that we do as a church, I, I still get nervous to this day. I've been doing this for, you know, decades. And I still, Becky and I, I get nervous and we get spiritual warfare. And to be honest with you, as I'm driving down to Coconut, uh, uh, you know, to the Coconut uh, Festival over here or to the, uh, the farm fair, the Kauai County Farm Fair, I would do anything to not go. Does that surprise you? I would do anything to just go and kayak and be away from everybody and not have to face the pressure and, and the spiritual warfare of actually engaging people about, uh, about Jesus Christ. And then I, but I go anyway. And you know why I go? I have to. I, I have to. I got to go. Which is another reason why stepping into leadership is so important because it, it helps you got to go and take care of business. So I got to go. I get there, and, and, and I start sharing the Lord with people, and I'm, I'm sharing the Lord with other the, the people in our team are sharing the Lord. People start getting saved, and I'm like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. This is awesome. I overcome the fear, and then it's just like shebang. You know, we start leading people to Christ left and right at this thing. People are hungry for God. They need someone to tell them and to love them enough to overcome all of that stuff that Satan throws at us to, to not engage. But when it's not there... I love the world. There's a gradual shift of priorities from spiritual to worldly. Hypocrisy sets in because suddenly we have a very clear command in Scripture about what we're supposed to do, but we don't do it. And by virtue of that, we, we open the door in our life to, to have that same thing happen in other areas where the Bible says don't be sexually immoral. And we like, well, I'm not going to obey that one. You know, honor your parents. I'm not going to do that one. Don't steal. Well, Tax season, the government's ripping me off anyway. They stole from me, I'll steal from them. You, you see, it, it's just like opens this door of hypocrisy, which leads to legalism. We go AWOL without leave, and then we begin to rationalize the non-participation in the mission. And probably the biggest uh, uh, thing that we say is that I'm just not gifted in that. I don't know how to do it, it's just not me. And, and the reality is, is that it is you. You are called to do it. It's the mandate from God but it's like it's Satan has turned something so good into something so scary for us that, we, that we, we actually are the ones that are declining. Satan can't make us not be a part of this mission, but he can convince us that it's not good for us and that we're not qualified enough and that we don't know enough and no one will listen to us. And who's going to want to get discipled by me? And if I start discipling people, that means I'm actually going to have to walk with Christ myself. Yeah. I love Paul's words in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. 1. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. And when you're a disciple maker, something happens. It's like you got, you know, how many people, I want to ask you, but there are a lot of people that before you had kids, you did certain things that you don't do anymore. You had kids. You started coming back to church when you had kids. Why? Because you knew that they needed that input. You, you didn't need it for yourself but you started coming because you wanted the kids to have it. People quit smoking. They quit doing drugs. Uh, you know, they quit all kinds of things when they have kids because they, they're, oh, they're stepping up. Somebody's watching me. They stop using foul language, whatever it is. And, and in essence, one of the greatest things that could ever happen to a Christian to accelerate your growth in Christ is simply to take responsibility for somebody else. And it's not like we're taking on their whole life. And, uh, and I was talking to somebody last night. It's not, we're not talking about people that are, are sponging and using people and, and grinding on you and wearing you down and taking everything you've got and then throwing it in your face when you're done and saying, I'm out of here. You're not even a Christian. How can you call yourself? I'm not talking about people like that. Those aren't the people that are, are ready for discipleship. 
the people I'm talking about are people just like you that just, wow, I'd never, nobody's ever taught me how to have a quiet time. I, I'd kind of be interested in that. And, and they're not looking to move into your house and they're not looking to take everything that you own and they're not looking to take every minute of your life. They just need somebody to come alongside like I was when I was young and say, I'm willing to disciple you. So let me, let me tell you a quick story, very brief. I was in ministry for about three years uh, and, and I was very, very busy in ministry. I worked 90, 100 hour work weeks. All I did was work and sleep and do ministry and I loved it, but I wasn't making any disciples. I came across this text over and over in my study of the Bible in the first few years and I thought, why, why, why am I not doing this? And I don't know how to do this. And why am I not learning how to do this? I must have to go to seminary. So I went to seminary, and you know what I discovered? They taught everything except that. And seminary doesn't teach it. So our pulpits across the nation, it's not just the one I went to. I went to a really good seminary, really biblically based. But there's seminaries all across the, the globe in the United States that they teach everything except how to be a part of the Great Commission and successfully reproduce yourself in your Christian life. And I thought I would get it there. I didn't get it there. I started reading books. I read a book called The Lost Art of Disciple Making by Leroy Iams. I'm going to say it slower so you can write it down. Lost Art of Disciple Making. Lost Art of Disciple Making. Leroy Iams. E-I-M-S. If, if you can't remember, ask me afterwards. I read that book. I got to chapter one. I fell on my knees on my... You remember that carpet in that little apartment? Harvest gold. You know, appliances, brown carpet, orange curtains. It was awesome. <laughs> and as much as, I, as that carpet smelled, I got down on my face because I was just so broken by reading this book because it described me. Busy, 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 but not making disciples. And I, I, I read through that book, and I, and I made a commitment right there on as much as I knew how to, not to the Lord so much as to myself, that come hell or high water, I was going to learn how to make a disciple. I was not going to go to the end of my life you know, covering my eyes and pretending I can't see and don't understand Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And so it's been a long journey for me. And, um, and I've had help along the way, but most of it's been self-taught. Most of it's through reading and a lot of it just through watching and looking at the example of scripture. All to say it's possible for anybody. If I can do it, anybody can do it. And as a church, we're not, we're not just saying, just get out there and read a book and figure it out yourself. We're a church that will actually train you and teach you. In, in segments. So you don't, you're, even you don't have to make some big, long commitment. You want to learn how to teach somebody how to have a really effective, quiet time, where after you teach them, they're going to blow their minds, and they'll want to continue on, and you, all you have to do is invest maybe a couple of weeks in helping them get started. Does that interest anybody? Well, for, a lot, for some people, it will, and, and, and it may interest you later. How about learning how to pray? How about overcoming sin and temptation? You know, these ba very basic things that we all struggle with. Now, I, I, I was uh, having a discussion with the Bible college, and this is a little bit more complex question, but, you know, how do you, how do you balance the sovereignty of God and the free will of man? These are the kind of questions that, are, that, that people that have been walking with the Lord for a long time have, but the questions that new believers have is, is what's Matthew? <laughs> and, and we're, like, convinced that we, we don't know enough to tell people how to turn to Matthew 28, 19, and 20, because... People are asking these, you know, how many angels on the head of a pin questions. Those aren't the questions that, that people who are hungry for God are asking. They're asking very basic things that probably all of you here, maybe there might be an exception or two of somebody that's new to the church or new to the faith, but almost all of you are experts and know way more than you need to know to be able to help a new believer make progress in their walk with God. And so that was a journey that began 35 years ago, and I bumped along and bumbled along and, and uh, collected tools and resources to be able to be successful in it. I don't have the end-all game in this thing, but I am in the game. And, and our church doesn't have the answer to everything, and we don't understand the game completely, but we're in the game. And we're moving forward, and we're doing what God has called us to do. We're loving what God loves, and we're caring for the bride of Christ, and we're seeking that which is lost in the name of Jesus. Let me give you some benefits real quickly, uh, and I'll wrap this up. First of all, if you decide to participate and to make a decision that, you know, I'm not willing any longer as a Christian to ignore this and to justify this and rationalize my lack of participation, then this is what awaits you. First of all, you will be expressing love for God. Why? Because John 14, 21 says that whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. 
and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. All these benefits accrue to the people that love God. What does God say to do? Make disciples. Make disciples. The other benefit is that it assures us that we are his disciples. Uh, he was talking to his disciples in John 15, 8, and he says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So one of the evidences of a true follower of Christ is that they, they're replicating themselves. They're reproducing themselves. They have purpose in their life. Uh, Jesus said, I didn't, uh, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, much fruit, lasting fruit, to the glory of God the Father. It builds discipline in your life to make disciples for all the reasons I said earlier. When you begin to take up responsibility for another person and not just worry about yourself anymore, then suddenly it's like, wow, I've got, a, I, I, I've got somebody looking to me as an example. I've got to straighten this up. I can't live in sin in this area anymore. I've got to really walk with God. If you're, having, if you're teaching somebody how to have a, a journal of quiet time, but you don't journal your own quiet time, a little embarrassing. You can't really tell somebody else, you know, it's really important to have a journal of quiet time if you're not having one yourself. So it, it's, uh, the answer is to not teach it because you don't have a journal of quiet time. The answer is, well, step up and start journaling your quiet time and learn how important that is and valuable it is and life-transforming it is. And then pass that on, and it really steps you up in your own game because somebody else is watching you and you're mentoring someone else. It also, because of that, leads to maturity. You're not on, on milk anymore, but you're on solid food, and you become acquainted with the truths of the faith because nothing helps a person grasp and understand and comprehend the truth of God like teaching the Word of God. And it doesn't mean that you have to be up here teaching it. It just means that in the quietness of a relationship at Starbucks or down at the beach, you're, you're talking together about the Word of God. And in that context, you grow and mature in your faith. That leads to zeal, that leads to joy. When the 72 returned in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, after Jesus sent them out on a short-term mission, they came back and they were just, it was epic, you know? I mean, they were going off. They were so excited. Jesus almost had to calm them down, you know? And, and, but they were excited. Why were they excited? Because they were not just watching Jesus do it anymore. They were in the game. Being in the game brought them intense joy, and it still does today. And that bears fruit. And that leads to a promised reward. 1 Corinthians 3 says that the man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose and each will be rewarded according to their own labor. Jesus in Revelation 22 verse 12 says this, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about everything, obviously. Obviously. But pointedly, it's the Great Commission. That's what the manager has left us with responsibility for. Our manager, in essence, has left the store and put us in charge. And he says, this is what I want you to do. This is, what I'm, I'm, uh, this is the produce, this is the product of your work that I want to see developed. I want lots and lots and lots of people just like you, not perfect, not, not completely knowing or understanding everything, even willing to admit, I don't have it all together, but I am not going to any longer justify or rationalize my non-participation in the great white elephant in evangelical Christianity is that I'm not engaged. I'm not engaged in the most important thing. Now, that engagement can take place through a Bible study. It can take place through an outreach or feeding the homeless. It can be engaged through the Anahola outreaches that we have. It can be engaged in fellowshipping and praying with people afterwards. It's not just some classroom experience. It's the engagement of caring for other people. Let me put it this simply. It's the engagement of you loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and just falling in love with Him. Falling in love with Him, being intimate with Him, and then loving what He loves. And what does He love? He loves people. And He says, love me and love others in the same manner that you love me. Love others. And there's nothing that we could do that would be a greater act of service or kindness or benefit for another person than to help them find Jesus. And then to help them understand how to walk with Jesus. And then to help them become reproductive in their own Christian life. So you guys are so talented. You've got so many gifts. I don't want to fill your head with you've got to do it this way and there's a methodology and you've got to go through this particular program. Yes, we have tools. But at the end of the day, God wants you to pray. God wants you to seek his face. God wants you to come and say, Holy Spirit, fill me, fill me, lead me. Help me keep in step with you so that my life, my family, my marriage, my children, 
my business, the place I work, the community I live in is impacted in a positive way for the kingdom of God and for the advancement of this great commission. And if we do that, that, then something begins to happen and it's happening in this church. It's already been going on for a long time, but I just, I, I, I feel compelled. I didn't, this isn't my hobby horse, although I really like this topic. It just happens to be where we're in the text of scripture. In two weeks, I'll talk a little bit more detail about the actual words and what, what, what they all mean. But for today, I just wanted to talk about what's it, what's it at cost here? What, what the, what's at risk? And the risk is that we, we buy into Satan's corrupted, devalued, diminished plan for what it means to be a Christian. And, and we struggle with it. We wonder if we're the only ones that are experiencing those things. And the answer is no, you're not the only ones experiencing these things. No, you're not the only one that fails. No, you're not the only one that feels guilty sometimes when you hear a message like this. No, you're not the only one that has never been trained and never discipled. We're everywhere. We're all over the place in the church. But it doesn't have to stay that way. And so I want to encourage you, whether you've been a Christian, you know, a few weeks or 50 years, the only thing that's really necessary is a heart for God, a heart for people, and the humility to say, I don't know how to do this. Would you help me? And so I'm praying that God's just going to continue to raise up an army of men and women on this island who have that heart to say, I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know what I have to do. I don't understand all the steps. I'm not even sure how to begin. But by God's grace, by God's power, and by God's will, I cannot ignore this commission even one more day. And the result will be your life will be changed. It'll never, ever be the same and you'll never want to go back. You'll have problems. There'll be messes in your life. Working with people is hard, just like having kids. But at the end of the day, when you, when you see your child, that's, that's a miracle. But when you see your grandbaby and when you see your great-grandbaby and when you're a, a Christian and, and this, these cycles can accelerate, you don't have to wait 20 years for the next one, but they accelerate and you can have somebody in your church like uh, one of the people that comes to mind is a gal named Miggy, and uh, she's a Chinese biochemist and retired. She got saved, and within the first couple of weeks, she was already winning people to Christ. We taught her how to disciple using the same tools we taught her. She started meetings with these people. By like week six or eight, there was a, then that person won something. I mean, she was, a great, she was a grandmother within the first two months of being a Christian. And she got all excited, all animated. And that's what happens when somebody is actually engaged. It, it doesn't take, you know, a biochemist. It wasn't that that made it possible. It was just her humility and her willingness and her own, own excitement about her walk with God and some very simple tools that made it all possible. So I want to encourage you, church, you are doing a great job. This is a, one of the healthiest places I've ever... I, I, I enjoy this church. I love this church, not because I'm, I'm in leadership here, but I, you guys are just... You're filled with the Spirit of God. You're walking with Him to the best of your ability. You're moving forward you're open, you love each other, you love the Lord, he's working in you and through you, you're a fragrant aroma of Christ, and all we're doing is we're talking about fine-tuning and making what God is doing here even more effective for the eternal work of God. Think in terms of steps. Don't think in terms of, I'm, I'm here and I need to be there, it's hopeless. Just think in terms of little steps. Are you in the Word yourself? Do you know how to have a quiet time? Then ask if you don't know how. If you know how, then get back in the Word of God. Get before God. Do what I did. Get on, your, get on the carpet. Brown, harvest color, you know, appliances, whatever you got. Uh, but get there. I don't even think those exist anymore. Uh, but get on your face before God and say, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do it, but my eyes are on you. You will help me. You will enable me. You will make it possible because this is your command. He will never command us to do something that's not possible. This is possible. This is life-changing. This is his command. Father, we thank you for this time this morning and just the joy of being able to be a part of, of a, a fellowship that loves you. And we love each other, Lord. We, we, we know that we don't have everything wired. We'll never get it completely wired. It's, it's just like parenting. If we have to have everything and understand every possible nuance of how to parent and under circumstances of illness or, you know, uh, uh, certain challenges with behavior problems. If we had to know all that stuff before we got started, we'd never get started. But God, you, you, you pour into us this great love for you. And, and Lord, when that love pours into our heart, it creates a love for other people. 
if it's truly a love for you. And that love for others creates a desire that they would know eternal life and that they would not suffer the bondage and the suffering that awaits those that don't come to saving faith in Christ for eternity, separated from Christ. And so God, there's a mission you've given us and this is not a, a, a burden. Lord, this is a blessing. This is, this is our ticket to the epic life. This is the pathway that you've designed for us to experience the greatest life a man or woman could ever have, the greatest fruit, the greatest reward, the greatest sense of nobility and, and self-governance that you put into us by your spirit to be a part of your work. And so, Lord, I'm praying, stir our hearts up, Lord. I pray that no one would leave here feeling bad or feeling defeated. I pray that you would move us and that you would prompt us by your spirit to have a desire to respond by saying, yes, Lord. I don't even know how it's going to happen, but yes, God, please make it so that we might fulfill your calling in these days in which we're living. Bless each man and woman here, Lord. We do have burdens and concerns and anxieties, challenges, some people are absolutely broken this morning and they barely, can, they barely got here. God, meet their need. Show your great power in their behalf. God, bless the marriages here that are struggling. Bless the kids that are wayward. God, move us as a congregation and move our families and those that we're connected to to a closer walk with Christ, God. Have your way. Favor your church. But God, give us an unrelenting heart to obey the Great Commission. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. This Epic Life podcast, as well as all the Epic Life outreach platforms, are listener-supported. Will you consider partnering with us through a special gift? Go to theepiclife.org to learn more and stay connected. Please consider inviting others to hear the good news. Be bold and live the Epic Life with Jesus.